And welcome to our author panel today. So you want to write a book, advice from fellow alumni. Um, it's great to have you here. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Katie Pandis with Alumni Career Services. And we work with alumni in all kinds of career transitions and support them with programming, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and a lot of online content and tools. I'm going to leave the panelist introductions to our very capable moderator, Robbie Kelman Baxter. But let me just say a few words of introduction about Robbie, who we've worked with um, on a couple of occasions in the past. She's from the class of 96 and has her own independent consultancy that focuses on subscription pricing and membership models. And she's written two books on those topics. So she'll have a lot to offer about publishing business books. Um, but she really loves to support fellow alums and originated the idea of this panel itself. So we're really glad she did. Um, just because alumni really, uh, part of their career, a very common part of alumni career paths includes writing books. So Robbie, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you for now and to get us going. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Katie. And thanks for, um, for, uh, for, for jumping on this idea. Um, the way it started actually is um, at the beginning of the shelter in place time um, uh, earlier this spring, uh, our class, class of 96, like many other GSB classes, um, we started to just gather um, on our own um, on Zoom calls, talk about how we were feeling, what was going on, help each other, catch up. Um, we all had a little more time on our hands, or a lot of us did. And um, one of the ideas, we, we had like three or four, I think, Shelby, right, um, of, these, of these sessions. And um, one of them, you know, we realized like we have, I think, eight or nine or ten published authors in our class alone. And so we, we did a panel just our, ourselves, and it was so fun and engaging. And a lot of people in our class, it turned out, were thinking about writing, um, and not just business books, but also, um, you know, fiction, memoir, self-help, um, children's books, uh, you know, research into other topics that are not about business, so other kinds of, um, of nonfiction research-oriented books. And so I thought, well, gosh, if, if it's that if there's that much energy in our class, there must be uh, in, in other classes as well. So that was kind of the germ of the idea. And, um, you know, Shilpi Samaya Gouda, who is a classmate of mine, uh, who's been incredibly successful uh, with, with, her, with her writing, uh, was on that panel. So, um, you know, I, I brought her along. And then uh, uh, Oladayan um, Oladapo um, is from the class of 2020. So, uh, you know, kind of much more young and <laughs> a more recent class um, than, than Shelby and me, which I think is great to give a different, a different perspective and um, has been writing a series, uh, a couple of series of, of children's books. So I'm going to um, turn it over to them now and ask them each if they can uh, do a brief introduction and just talk about um, your, your class, your year, which is up there, and the kinds of books that you've been writing. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, um, I'll start with, with Shelby. Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks to Robbie for organizing this panel. Um, it's always great to get together with fellow Stanford alums. Um, so I was class of 96, as Robbie mentioned, and um, I started writing about 10 or 15 years after leaving business school. Um, I worked in mainly in strategy and new business development in the retail and consumer sector after B school and you know first with startups and then later as a consultant to larger companies and I loved it. Um, the reason I started writing was I had a sort of a very abrupt geographic change. Um, my family and I decided to move to Dallas for my husband's work and I suddenly didn't have any of my network or contacts or, um, you know, previous sort of business um, connections. And I thought I, I was going to do something fun for the first year that I was there. So I started taking writing classes at um, SMU. And that, you know, just sort of snowballed into what has now become a writing career. So I, I sort of fell into it very serendipitously. 
I would not say that I always wanted to be a writer. I always loved books. Um, it was always my favorite thing to do was to read fiction. So I was very passionate and involved in it. Um, but I didn't really consider it a career option until it became one. Um, so that's just sort of a, um, a beacon for the rest of you who may or may not be thinking about doing something is, you know, sometimes you don't have to plan it all out. Sometimes things just work out that way. Um, so I've written three novels. Um, they are, they've all been published with, uh, with HarperCollins. And uh, the first one is called Secret Daughter, the second one, The Golden Sun, and the third one, um, which just came out a couple months ago, have here for you is called The Shape of Family. Um, and they are, uh, the best way for me to describe them are sort of multicultural, multi-generational family stories. Great. Thank you, Shelby. Um, Ola Doyen, do you want to um, share your background with the group? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Ola Doyen, and I have been an alumni for like two months now. So I'm really excited <laughs> to join this family. I went to Wesleyan University for undergrad, which is a small liberal arts school. And one of my majors was sociology. And um, there I started studying culturally relevant pedagogy, which is really just the idea that children learn better when they can see themselves in the content that they are consuming. So what really started as a project uh, to write more culturally representative stories ended up becoming Idunu Studios, which is a team of writers and illustrators and designers that create content for children. And for me, I'm really excited about creating content that is multicultural, but it's not about being multicultural because a lot of the books that I was seeing out there was almost like textbooks for children, like teaching them, you know, this is what Indians look like and this is what their clothes look like and this is the language they speak. And I think that that's interesting, but I think to take it a step further, I wanted to create content that was just like any other book within the mainstream. So really focusing on the narrative, the adventure, and it just so happens that the main character is from India or from Trinidad or from Ghana and all the dozens of other countries that I've been able to explore within those narratives. So I've done that for about six years now um, and it's been really exciting. Yeah, oh, awesome. So so I have a question um, for both of you. You know, I, I'm the only... I'm, we're all we're all business school alums. Um, some of us for longer than others, um, and and but but I'm the only one that has has written books on business. Um, and both of you are fiction writers, creative writers, doing you know kind of in a very different genre and a sort of surprising path, I think, for business school alums. And I'm curious, um, do you see your business background? Are you still, do you consider yourself an author now? Is that kind of your full time? If you introduced yourself to somebody, would you say, I am an author? Or would you say, I'm a something else who also has written some books? What, what's the role that being an author is playing in your, in your life right now? Uh, for me, I would say, yes, now I describe myself as an author. I didn't right away. I mean, even when I published my first book in 2010, I had sort of done it as a, you know, as a break. I was going to go back to my consulting practice, which I had been juggling both. And as soon as my book came out, I was planning to go back to consulting. And uh, then I just did, then it became more compelling to write a second book. So that that previous career just sort of faded away. Um, but it still took me quite a while to describe myself as an author. When people ask me what I did for the first year or two, I sort of bumble out some answer. Um, but now um, I do describe myself as a full-time author. I, people sometimes ask me if they know what my previous career was, if I plan to go back to business or if I miss it. Um, and I do, you know, I do miss it. And I do sort of plan to do something in the realm of business. I think, um, for me, fiction, I would not have been able to write fiction until I had lived some life. So um, while business school wasn't training, uh, you know, it wasn't very direct training to write a novel, I think going through all of those life experiences and career changes and developments absolutely led to the moment where I was ready to write a novel. And I think that continues to be true. So I just sort of think of it as a very weird multi-dimensional um, <laughs> uh, career. And it, it makes sense to me in retrospect. Uh, it certainly doesn't, you know, it's not a, it's not a proven path, but um, it, it, I see how it all comes together now. 
Awesome. Awesome. How about you, Diane? I, I definitely agree on that multi-dimensional point. I still don't really introduce myself as an author. Um, it's usually in conjunction to so many other things because similar to Shopee, I kind of fell into this. So this actually started as a toy company. So in my mind, I was going to create all things multicultural for children. And I started that with toys, designing a prototype for what, you know, an Indian doll might look like, a Nigerian doll might look like, what their costumes and their play sets would look like. And the stories were actually a complement to the toys, but that ended up being so core to the mission of education and exposure that they took off and I only ever launched the stories and not the toys. Um, but now I'm actually working on an animated series um, that is based on one of my stories. So I, I see myself more as a creator and as the owner of a creative company, which is where the business school background is hopefully going to come into play. But writer is definitely in there. I just don't always immediately introduce myself as one. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, both of you are talking about sort of one is this concept of a portfolio life and an evolution of where the the authorship fits in. Um, for me, I'll just I'll just pipe in. Um, I, I, I wrote my books very deliberately for my work. Um, so I've been a consultant, um, as, as Katie said, I've been a consultant for the last uh, 20, plus, 20 plus years and an independent consultant. And um, if you want to be an independent consultant and you don't want to be kind of a, a contractor stepping in and filling a role for somebody, even if that's a very high level role, I believe you need to have an area of subject matter expertise um, or you need to grow a firm. And I wanted to do the former. So, you know, from the very beginning, I was trying to find what is that, what is that thing that is, that is big enough that it will be interesting to me for my life and, and, and yet narrow enough that I can credibly claim expertise in it. And I had, you know, different consulting gigs and I worked at Netflix and I was like, ah, oh, this is something really, really interesting to me. And I'm going to double down on this and study it and kind of claim some expertise. And that's kind of the roots of, of my writing. Um, originally, I really just wanted a one pound business card, you know, something to say, you know, you want to know who I am and what my point of view is, here's my book. And if you like it and you like that point of view, you might want to work with me. Um, but the book ended up kind of taking on a life of its own. Um, and I think like the other panelists, um, author is now part of who I am and, and what I say, although at the beginning I was a consultant and then maybe deep into the conversation I'd say, oh yeah, I did write, I wrote a book or I'm working on a book. Um, but now it's, it's become, you know, now that I've written two books, it's become kind of a core part of, of how, I, how I define myself. Um, one, of, one of the things, you know, as a, as a business person, I don't know if it's as a business person or, or just kind of the way that my mind works, you know, understanding the process is, has always been something really important. And also thinking about everything in terms of strategy um, has <laughs> always been kind of just the way that, that my brain works. And so I'm really interested. I remember, um, you know, Shilpi, when you first wrote your book, um, the first book, the one that came out in 2010, um, The Secret Daughter, uh, I was so interested in your process, um, the, the writing process, the publishing process, um, how you thought about it. And, and I would love it if you could share that with the group, kind of from, from your writing class um, that, that you mentioned at SMU, all the way to publishing um, that, that first book. Sure. Um, yes, it's... it's um... Again, as I mentioned before, it's kind of an unusual path, but I think there are more unusual paths in writing and publishing than there are conventional ones. So um, I started taking basically night school classes at SMU, and there were a series of classes called Novel 1, Novel 2, and Novel 3. And I thought, okay, well, that's as good as anything. In fact, I should probably back up and say, I thought I would start writing short stories because they were short and I hadn't written <laughs> anything in my life. And I thought, well, I might as well start with the, you know, with the short thing, but that class was full. So I ended up signing up for novel one. And I'm really glad I did because ultimately I did want to write a novel. That's sort of how my brain thinks about stories because that's what I read. Um, but I, you know, I didn't know that they were two completely different skill sets. So I, again, sort of fell into the right thing. Um, but I took, they were, each of those were a six week class. It was like six Mondays from eight to 10 PM. And you were expected to sort of write your actual novel in between those classes. So they were, for me, they were spread out over probably a year and a half. 
Um, and after I met some people in those classes, I put together a writing group for myself. So I picked basically the smartest, most interesting person from each of those three classes. And we formed a four woman writing group. And we just met once a month and kept each other accountable. We would share, you know, a chapter of our work in progress with each other and then be open to the criticism on it. So it was, a, it was a pretty big investment of time because I was reading, in addition to trying to write, I was reading, you know, 40 to 50 pages a month and writing a detailed, you know, critique for each of my um, fellow group members. But that was really important for me because it's, it's hard to write in a vacuum and it's hard to know, especially if you were like me and you had no experience in it, it's hard to know if what you're intending to do is actually landing with your reader. So I found that really helpful and it also just kept me on track, kept me writing. Um, in the very beginning, a friend of mine who had already written a novel, uh, hadn't, he hadn't gotten it published yet, but he had written one. I said, you know, I just don't know if I can, I've never written anything that long. The longest thing I'd ever written was a like 80 page economics thesis in college that was super dry and full of statistics. <laughs> and he said, you know, you know, so I'd done all my research and I'd plotted it out and I'd taken all the classes, but I just could not sit down and start writing. There was something very, I mean, obviously it was probably fear and a lot of other things wrapped up in that. Um, and this friend said to me, you know, a novel is 100,000 words. So if you write 1,000 words a day, you'll be done with a draft in three months. And then you'll have something to work with. And it just, it, first of all, that seemed way too much to me. I was like, I, I immediately had a bunch of reasons why I couldn't possibly write 1,000 words a day. I had two little kids under the age of three. I was not sleeping. Um, and he kind of waited for me to finish. And then he said, okay, so write 500 words a day. You'll be done in six months. And there was something, I think, you know, I'm, I'm actually a very analytical person, even though I write fiction, there was something about that calculus that just clicked for me. Because 500 words is two double space pages. And I knew I could do that. I could, they didn't have to be good words or good pages, but I could sit down and write 500 words a day and keep myself on a spreadsheet and on a calendar and have something at the end of six months. And that's what I did. I literally, the next morning, I created a spreadsheet with all the dates down the left-hand side and my goal. And I didn't really let myself look up until I had that first draft. And, and then that was, you know, sort of something I began to work with. Um, and from there, once I had a draft, I, you know, started um, reaching out to literary agents. I went to a, a um, conference in New York where I sat down with several editors and agents who read a sample of my work and gave me some, you know, just uh, top level feedback on it. And out of that process, I ended up finding a literary agent in sort of the conventional way by sending out a query letter and having a, you know, having a, a couple of people offer to represent me. And then I chose the one that I thought was the best fit for me. Um, and I chose her because someone said to me, you know, there are gentleman agents and there are shark agents. And this particular woman I was considering was a gentleman agent. And I thought, well, I, I don't really know what those two things mean in the publishing industry, but I'm pretty sure I don't want the shark. So um, I went with the gentleman agent. She was also a former editor. So she was a new agent, but she had been an editor for 15 years with some very strong literary um, house imprints. And so I wanted someone who could help me improve my writing because I was, you know, I was a total amateur. I'd had very little feedback on my work. I knew it wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, and that was kind of a be careful what you wish for scenario because once I signed on with her, I spent another 18 months revising that book under her direction until she finally thought it was ready. So it took probably three years from beginning to end, a year and a half on my own, a year and a half with my agent. Um, and then she was able to sell it to HarperCollins. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. And, and that's quite a, pro I mean, there's a lot of elements of that process that I think are important to call out. One of them is your choice to get an agent um, and, um, and your willingness to go back to the drawing board and you know, take her advice. And the other thing that I think is really important is your mention of the writer's process, the way that you broke it out um, you know, 500 words a day or 1,000 words a day, and also finding that small group of, of peers who are going through that at the same time. Um, 
you know, talking to authors, I hear that over and over again, that, that a lot of successful authors, especially in the beginning, find other people like them who are going through the process to just share, share experiences, hold each other accountable, uh, offer advice, connections, whatever. So I th that's great. Um, how about you, um, Oladoyan? Yeah, so I self-published all of my books. Like I mentioned initially, I thought I was starting a toy company and I was just writing these books to go with toys. And so I had ownership of all of the books and I also knew that I was going to expand into other forms of content later on. So I wanted to keep everything in-house. But like I mentioned, we had a team of writers and illustrators and designers. So we would write the books. I actually went to a local public school for six months and worked with children on the content every day after school, just to really understand how they were engaging with um, multicultural and diverse content and how to write it in a way that sticks. And after we uh, got a couple of drafts, we would rotate within each other, like you mentioned, having that writer's community, and it was really special to have that in-house. And then afterwards, I hired and contracted editors to look at the work. So even though it's self-published, I wanted everything to be as professional and just as good. So I actually hired some editors who were retired from um, some firms like Simon & Schuster to look at the work and they worked with me on each of the books for weeks, sometimes months at a time because some, some of the books we have are picture books but we also have some chapter books for older audiences and so those texts are, are longer. So we had about three editors that I routinely contracted to go through the, the text with me and then also with the illustrations. That was a huge part of it because I was very, very picky about the aesthetic. A lot of what I was writing, the purpose of it was to um, was to show more than tell. So it was very important for me to make sure that the children understood just how colorful each part of the culture is. And so I spent a lot of time going through different illustrators. I actually illustrated an entire book um, and then it didn't match the aesthetic that I was going for and I had to start from scratch. And Probably if I had my uh, my own publisher, I wouldn't have had to go through that, but that's that's the scrappy way of doing self-publishing. Um, so it, was, it felt very similar to startup life. Pre-writing this book, I had a startup in undergrad, so I, I had experience just kind of doing everything from scratch by myself, um, but making sure that I still pulled in all the resources that I could to make sure that even though this book is self-published, I have a lot of talent and a lot of smart people around me to make this um, worthwhile. But eventually, I still had to do my own distribution, my own marketing, and set up my own book tour and all that good stuff, but um, it's, still, it's still very doable. Yeah, no, it's it's such an interesting point that you bring up. Um, a lot of times people think that because you self-publish, you just like sit down, write it and, you know, send it out. But it, it really has become, I think, especially in maybe the last five or 10 years, um, a really viable path um, that gives you not just, you know, speed if you, you know, it gives you, you know, speed to get to market. It gives you more control over your, your output. Um, and it gives you, you know, the full the full amount of the revenue, um, which is which is different from from going through a a third party, you know, outside publisher. Which I think is important for anybody who's thinking about writing and publishing a book. Um, there are definitely pros and cons of um, of publishing it yourself. Um, and your point, Diane, where you said, you know, you re redid all the illustrations and you had to do that yourself and that wouldn't have happened with, with an outside publisher. I think what would have happened with an outside publisher is they would have said, uh, we already have the pictures, so we're gonna just, we like it and we're just gonna move forward and you're just the writer. So, you know, you, you do give up some, con I mean, I had to push, you know, for my book cover, I, I have this, um, uh, you know, my book's about, for, it's called The Forever Transaction, it has a, um, what do you call this? You know, uh, um, I'm struggling with the word, but it has that sign. Yeah, the infinity loop. Yes, it has an infinity loop, and I really wanted an infinity loop on the cover. And my um, publisher, McGraw Hill, they were like, "Well, we tried it, and it doesn't work, so we're not going to do it." And they had this other cover that had like a kind of a, I wish I had it handy, but they had like a zigzag on the cover, which was nice. But my friend said it looked like bondage. Um, it just because it was a little it like was a thick, heavy red band that zigzagged all the way around the book. Um, and they said that doesn't you know, you're trying to show people that it's easy to move to subscription. And this looks like a really convoluted hard path that has some bondage elements. So anyway, I pushed back and it was really actually pretty hard to push back and get them to do the cover that I wanted. So just an interesting thing for those of you who are, you know, thinking about, you know, should I go with a publisher? Or should I go my own route? Um, there are some kind of surprising benefits and challenges of, of, of either path. Um, 
So I wanted to pause um, because this is live and because um, so many of the people participating were kind enough to uh, post in the chat um, what, what they're here for and kind of what they're hoping to do. I thought it would be great, um, first of all, to direct people who haven't seen it to just take a peek because it's pretty interesting. And also to point out to the other panelists that we have a really nice mix of memoir, business books to help business lives, uh, fiction, novel, um, short stories, um, book being written with a professor, uh, you know, so really, really um, broad range. And also people that are kind of just thinking about writing a book and people who are all the way, I don't want to say at the finish line, but are getting ready to publish the book and thinking about that, that, um, that marketing process. So um, I want to just touch on that marketing uh, the marketing process. We were talking a little bit about resources. Um, uh, Oladoyan, you talked about hiring uh, some Simon and Schuster execs to, you know, to give you, a, a, you know, feedback, and also about stepping into the classroom as a way of getting input from future readers um, and from experts on those future readers. Um, I'm wondering if, if each of you could comment on what other resources you drew upon. Um, in the writing process and also we can even go into since we haven't talked about it the the post public publication process the marketing process the distribution process um, what kinds of resources did you use and um, what kinds of um, things did you learn in that part of the process um well because i'm with a you know a traditional large publisher i have largely left um the marketing and editing and all of those components up to them. I will say, I think there's more cross fertilization happening between the hybrid or self publishing world and the traditional published world. So many times now a publisher um, will pull in out, outside independent freelance experts who probably at the same time are working with um, self published authors. So for example, my, my second book, the Golden Sun was super painful to write. I mean, I had to like throw it away and start over from the blank page twice in the five year process of writing it. And by the end of that, both of my editors, my agent and I, none of us had fresh eyes anymore. None of us could be objective about whether we had solved the problems or whether the problems were still there, or whether the story was working. So one of my editors pulled in an independent freelance editor who I've now worked with on all my subsequent books. She is the last person to come in. Like she doesn't read any of the previous drafts. Her whole, her whole point of view is, you know, what is it like to, to have this, you know, this monstrosity that has been through the publishing juggernaut? What does it look like the first time you read it, you know, right before it goes to the shelf? So I know she's someone who also works with a lot of freelance um, and self-published authors. Um, and I know people, authors will sometimes hire those folks on their own, even before they submit the book to the publisher, even if they have a publishing contract, because there's less and less editing happening at the publisher level. And more and more of that is expected to be on the, you know, on the author's um, side of the fence. So I think there is some, you know, there are some lessons to be learned there. I always believe in like trying to make your work I do this with my books as good as they can possibly be before I ask one other person to read them because people are only going to be able to read something for the first time once. So I don't have anybody in my family or my writing group or my agent. I don't have anybody read anything until I've done like at least a couple full drafts by myself. And I've taken it to the point where I say, okay, I'm like, I'm at the limit of my ability. Now I need you know, I need some feedback from somewhere else. I need some help. Um, so that's probably the biggest um, component of, of, you know, seeking out resources. And then when it comes to the, you know, planning the book tour, um, again, I think there are a lot of ways that publishers are trying to get creative. The last couple of times I've published a book, they've done a blog tour or an NPR radio satellite tour, which you, you can do like from your office, you don't have to get on a plane and walk into a studio. And all of those, I think, are ideas, you know, in big social media campaigns, all of those, I think, are relatively creative ideas that have come from the self-publishing world, where people have had to go out and try to, you know, 
drum up some excitement for their books without the advantages of a of a traditional publisher. Yeah. Diane? Yeah. So like I mentioned with the self-publishing route, I try to hire someone who is professional in that particular step that I was in for every step of the way. So when I was editing, I had three editors, one from who was retired and independent, but had worked at Simon & Schuster, another from Scholastic. And I work a little bit differently when I'm writing children's books. I actually like after one or two drafts, start, start sending it out to people only because in the creative phase, um, there has been there has already been a lot of um, input in the brainstorming of how we're going to design the collection. Since it's a series, they all tend to follow a template or an outline. And so when we, since we built all that from the foundation, there's only so much that I can usually do at the beginning before I really need um, input. But that's just my, my personal writing style. And I'm seeing a similar pattern now that I'm writing an animated series. Um, but post uh, publication with the marketing, I followed the same suit. So I, I hired a professional um, PR person and a marketing person. I also had a lot of experience in social media. I'd worked for a social media company before and then um, done freelance social media management for other companies. So when it was time to social media manage my own brand, it came pretty easily. But I would recommend that if you are self-publishing and you don't understand social media to hire somebody who does. And luckily, young people are very good at that. And so a, a high school or college intern is, is relatively affordable. Um, to manage your social media for you and, and to drive up followers and engagement. So I would do everything from doing giveaways online to doing read-alongs on Instagram Live. And then more formal things like setting up my own book tour. I contacted my local library. Um, I used my alumni network. I, I hadn't gone to Stanford just at that point, um, but I used my alumni network of undergrad from Wesleyan to set up uh, visits at schools around the country and even a little bit uh, in, in Europe. So it was just like, literally every part of the process I had to handle up by myself. And for anything that I didn't know, I just hired a professional that understood it. And there was, I also had a book, a consultant that sort of helped me anytime I had a question, I was able to just like book 30 minutes with him to help me navigate, you know, okay, now I'm at this phase of the process. What do I do now? Yeah. Yeah. It's so, I mean, I think one of the things to point out is that there's not an obvious, it's kind of like a startup, like there's not an obvious path um, even, you know, historically there was like, you know, you want to write a book. So if it's a nonfiction book, you know, write a, write a proposal, um, get an agent, the agent gives you feedback, then you shop it around, then you get a publisher and you do whatever the publisher tells you and you're kind of off and running. Um, and if it's a fiction book, I think you write the whole book and then you do that same process. Um, and today, you know, even, you know, like I, I had my books published by a, by a traditional publisher, but I still invested a lot of my own time and, and honestly a lot of money in, um, in both producing the book and in marketing the book. And, you know, I'm a little different, I think, um, from the other two panelists in that my book is a marketing tool. So, you know, I've given away a lot of copies of my book when I, when I, published the book, I was okay with the idea that what if nobody bought it, I would still be happy if the book really expressed my point of view and my frameworks. Um, and I liked it. I was happy to give it away. Um, so very, very different perspective. Um, my first book, I was an English major in college. So I had a pretty high opinion of myself <laughs> and thought I could just do it all by myself. Um, and I got about halfway done. Um, I had a nine month timeline uh, to, to publish it. That's what McGraw-Hill gave me. So we signed the contract on New Year's Eve. And the book was due in September. And in May, I was like, this is a mess. And I have written myself into a cul-de-sac and I have nowhere to go. And I quickly like went out and interviewed three editors and I picked one and um, you know I, I had like I ended up using three different people to help me somebody to help me with the big idea and the story arc somebody to um, help me um, with some of the key chapters that were really rough and then somebody to smooth and polish with me um, with the second book I was um, much more proactive so on day one I hired an editor to help me all the way through the process um, my process is a little bit different because it's a research-based book um, and so it's a lot of interviews um, and 
So I, you know, I'd interview, you know, on different days, you know, I might say, okay, today I'm going to do some interviews. I, I have them all scheduled or today's a day for quiet writing, um, which is the hardest thing for me, or today's a day for editing, um, which is a little bit easier for me. And with the second book, especially, I showed it to everybody often. Um, and so I did not, like Shilpi did, I did not wait until the book was as good as I could make it. I just started getting feedback, like, and different kinds of feedback. So there were some people on my spreadsheet that were like um, clients and um, industry experts, where I was like, did they respect the content or did they find this content useful? And then I also sent it out. I'm on a group called AuthorS, which is a group of... Um, of uh, f women authors and you know there it was um you know if they wanted to read i was like is it does it read well does it read like a good book um so i got a lot of help and i also you know i saw somebody i think rebecca zucker asked the question about agent versus no agent and i went you know when i tried to get my first book published i actually went directly through a gsb contact she said oh just call the uh, publisher um and i bet they'll want to publish your book so i did i just called the publisher and they did make me an offer but then i got cold feet because i didn't know if it was a good offer and more importantly i didn't know if the contract was good so i went out and i got an agent and i ended up going with the same publisher but i felt a lot better having you know, knowing that he had looked at the contract, um, knowing that he had, you know, he sent me back for six more months to work on the book. Um, so I felt like I had a better, better product um, to, to deliver. Um, but I know a lot of people are like, why would you, why would you bring in an agent if you already have a relationship with a publisher? So again, it's, there's so many different paths I think that you can take. Um, and it's also really important to know why you're doing it. So if you're trying to do it because it's your your business calling card or you're trying to do it. I see some people on here are saying, this is a memoir. I want to share my life. Um, you know, you may want to have a lot of control over, over what you write and not have somebody say, well, that's not going to sell. So you have to change the structure or drop a section that you care about. Um, so, so on that note, yeah. I just want to say that some, so at least for fiction with a traditional, uh, one of the bigger publishers, say like the top 10 publishers, they will not work directly with an author who is unagented. That's mainly to protect their liability. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of contracts and legal language. And um, so if, you know, if you want to approach or ultimately be published with one of those, you have to have an agent. They'll, they'll sometimes, if they see something you've written, like if, you, if you're a blogger or something, they might reach out to you and say, hey, have you considered writing a book? Here are three agents I think you should call. Um, and then of course those agents are going to pay more attention to you since you're coming from a publisher. But um, you have to be agented, at least for the, the big, you know, the big publishers in fiction. Um, but another thing people will do, if they either don't have an agent and are working with a smaller publisher or self-publishing, or if they have an agent who's more on the, let's say, soft side, like maybe doesn't have lawyers in-house at their agency or doesn't understand the legal language as much, is you can join the Authors Guild, which I think has a fairly low, like a couple hundred dollar membership per year. It's a sliding scale based on your book revenue. Um, and they will do a legal review for you. Um, so that's a pretty efficient, cost efficient way of getting someone in your corner looking out for your interests. Yeah, so um, that is, it's a good point. It's, 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 it's tricky, you know, as, as a panel, because we come from, we have such different objectives and such different um, types of writing. Um, I think it's great. Hopefully it's useful for the audience to kind of hear some of the, the range of different ways of thinking about things and the different processes of these different um, paths to publishing. Um, I want to close out. We're going to have time for Q&A. I see some questions in the chat. And please, um, if you have other questions, feel free to put them there or in the Q&A feature. I think either one works. Um, but in the meantime, I'd love to you know, start with um, Oladoy. And if you can share some um, tips or guidance for um, fellow alums who are thinking about you know, either dipping their toe into the world of writing or diving right in, um, what, what guidance um, or advice do you have for them? I think for the creative process in particular, I really liked um, Shilpi's systematic approach of writing 500 or 1,000 words a day, and I think I should try that. I was more the, I'm going to, and I also don't have, you know, disclaimer, I don't have kids or a family. Um, I was more of the, I'm going to lock myself up for 
a week, a month, however long it takes. Nobody talked to me. I go get an Airbnb and retreat and I just like write everything that comes to my mind and then refine after that. Um, whatever process works for you, I think it's very important to find that process and experiment with different ways of writing. So for each collection that I wrote, I've written three, only two of them have been published, but for each collection I wrote, I kind of had a different creative process because the books had a different style and a different objective. And I actually enjoyed experimenting with that creative process because I feel that that is the most fun and fulfilling part of, of the writing in addition to when you're like sitting in front of children and, and reading to them. So I would really encourage people to, to find that mode that they feel that they create best in. And for me, it's like unplugging from the world. And um, I think a lot of writers or even creatives in general um, can agree sometimes mm -hmm. that when they can find that solitude, um, that their best creative juices come out. And also just to not disparage any ideas that come in that phase. So I'm an early morning person. So I like to wake up at like 5 a.m when it's still dark outside and the world is still sleeping and I just like start writing whatever comes to my mind, whether it's for books or anything else that, I, that I'm going through or working on. And I just find that I get some really harebrained ideas in that, in that period, but I think that that's when my mind is just being most creative. And then as I refine and work on that, um, I also get some really good gems. So working on your creative process, I think is really important. Yeah, definitely. Um, knowing your process. I love what you said about, you know, everybody does it a little bit differently. And I think that's super important that, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of writing books will say like, you know, write 10 pages every morning or, you know, go stay in a cave for three weeks or, you know, whatever it is. And, and that can work really well, but, you know, either it may not be viable for some people or it may not be the way that you, that you do best. Like for me, one of the things was to give my permission to kind of jump back and forth from different parts of the process. Like sometimes I just couldn't bring myself to do that creative thing that you talked about. And other times, you know, so like I, I didn't want to sit down and write a fresh idea. I didn't have any fresh ideas. So I'm like, okay, today's a day for editing or today's a day for making calls and scheduling interviews or today's a day for, you know, some other, you know, element of the, of the, you know, administrivia. Um, so I think that's, it's really important to just kind of know, know how you work and be kind to yourself um, while also pushing, always pushing forward. Um, what about you, Shilpi? Yeah. Uh, what would, advice do you have? I would second both of those ideas. I think that I know enough writers now to know that everybody has a different process. And so the, the key is to find what works for you. Um, and I think the only way you can do that is sort of being in it every day, at least in your mind. So you may not write new pages that day, you may not edit that day, but my favorite phrase is A, B, C, D, apply butt to chair daily, which means you are <laughs> like a job, whether you're writing that day or, you know, outlining or editing or marketing, you know, something, but you have to sort of be in it and you really do just have to, it's a volume of time and in, and sort of investment. So once you're, you know, I'm not sure it's 10,000 hours, but once you're several thousand hours into doing it every day, you will know what works best for you. Like, you know, I found weird habits, like being immersed in water releases something for me. So if I could go swimming or like get in the hot tub or in this, something like that, if I had a problem, I would get unstuck if I was immersed in water. And, you know, there are weird things like that, you know, that you, you realize you're an early morning writer or you like to write, you like to have an outline or you don't, you know, an outline is inhibiting or you feed off other people's creative energy or you absolutely have to be alone. I mean, you'll figure it out for yourself if you put in the time like every day or as close to every day as you can for months and months and months and years. <laughs> it's, it's, there's, no, there's no simple way to it, but it means that if you invest in it, you'll get there. Yeah, I love that. That's perfect. Um, perfect closing words. Unless, um, Diane, do you have anything, any final words you want to say? Or no, that was good. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, Shelby, I think that was that was great the way you the way you closed us out. So um, at this point, we're going to move to a Q and A. I see there's a bunch of um, a bunch of questions already in the chat, and um, I will hand it off to Q and A. Stephanie Cervantes, I had a question regarding how best to get feedback from your target reader group or from beta readers. How do you find them? And then what do you share? Is it a chapter, the whole manuscript? How to leverage that kind of process? 
I was just going to comment on that because I actually wrote my books with my target audience. So it was really easy to find mine, their children. And so I, I volunteered at a local elementary school's after school program. And so while I was in the creative phase before I had put any um, pen to paper, I started uh, talking to them about the themes that I wanted to explore. And I just started asking them questions about uh, diverse cultures and different countries around the world and seeing how they engaged with it as I would create like little um, mock up paragraphs of stories and see and saw, notice what stuck and what didn't stuck. I would watch them intently and, and time like, okay, at what line did their eyes just kind of like phase off? And at what point did it seem like they got uninterested? And I would ask them why. And I also incorporated them with the illustrations. I remember for every little thing, like when I was drawing a little girl with an Afro versus, you know, uh, another hairstyle, I would ask them a lot of questions. So I went straight to the source and then afterwards when I had finished uh, writing the book, I focused mainly on getting feedback from uh, educators and editors at that point, but still people who had a lot of experience with that target demographic uh, specifically. I wanted to hear more about writing groups and uh, working with other writers. Um, particularly, uh, I ha do have a contract with um, Stanford University Press just signed and I have chapter submissions but it's a very lonely process along the way. And I would love to get, you know, what you guys are talking about, the rounds of feedback. And it seems like the great way to do that would be with uh, other writers where you're sort of exchanging services, reading their chapters, and they read yours. So that, that was really compelling to me. I'd love to hear ideas about how to actually uh, pull one of those groups together. You wanna, one of you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, well, I, put together a group of people that I thought would be able to give me um, good criticism as because that was the most important thing to me. I and but I know other people like who write in pairs or triads like back in the day when people would go to coffee shops, they would just have like a daily or weekly meetup like Monday at 10 o'clock at Starbucks, we sit there and write because they needed that um, accountability. They sort of need it's like having a workout partner, it would just make them do it. Um, so I think it depends what you're looking for. I, I mean, that I didn't need or want that. I like to write in complete silence uh, with no coffee shop stuff around. So um, I, you know, like to meet with people once a month to, to get their criticism and to give, give, you know, them my criticism. But if you're looking for more like daily, you know, partnership or somebody, somebody to bounce ideas off of, I would suggest you just, you know, define that for yourself first, what you're looking for, and then you can find the people who are, who have the same need. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that. Um, it, in, in some ways, it reminded, you know, the process reminded me a little bit of, um, you know, baby groups when you're, you know, when you're a new mom or, you know, new parent. I remember when I, you know, that when I found out I was pregnant, I immediately tried to find who were the other people that I knew that were pregnant at that moment that were going to, you know, that, that were interested in talking about the same things at the level of depth that I wanted to talk about them. Um, and so I, I think like Shilpi, I went out and found people who were writing books, like, you know, people, there were mostly people that I, that I kind of knew, I would say, um, but, but I really wanted to have other people that were, you know, right in the process with me. For my first book, I had a friend who I knew professionally, and then I heard that she had just started writing a book as well, or she had just gotten her writing deal right at the same time as me. Um, and so we kind of went through the process together. Um, but I think as Shilpi says, it really depends what your, what your goal is. If you want an accountability partner, um, you know, try to find somebody who's kind of going through the process on the same timeline as you. Um, but if you want to get feedback on your, on your work, um, there, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more, you know, kind of open space. You know, I think for me, I actually, I made, like, I'm a list maker. I have this huge spreadsheet and I wrote all the people that I thought could help me in any way with the book. And I keep adding to it. And it's everything from somebody I could interview to somebody whose podcast I want to be on to somebody who could read the book for, you know, how readable is it versus how good is the content versus, um, how, how much, you know, would they want to read it versus, you know, my parents who told me where the commas needed to go. Um, and, and to just have that list. And, and on that list are people who say, like, throughout the process, they're like, I'll read your book. Um, lots of, like, if you tell people you're working on a book, there's a lot of people who will, I think, offer. And also, if you put it out there into, there's all kinds of writing groups and writing communities. 
and if you put it out there, there's a lot of people who are, who are going through this journey. It's, it's more about just opening yourself up to it. And, and I also think that in the Stanford community, there's a lot of writers and a lot of, um, you know, GSB folks who, honestly, a lot of my classmates read, read my book at different stages, which I really appreciate. Um, uh, Robbie has touched on my question a little bit already, but what are some ways that you leveraged Stanford's network along the road to publishing? Uh, and for those of us who are much earlier in the process, uh, what are some ways that you would recommend um, that we tap into Stanford's network? I published mine before Stanford, so I'll give this to, to Shilpi, but I will say now that I'm writing an animated series, there has been so much help within my classmates alone. My producers are my classmates, and we've been able to set up meetings with so many um, production companies and people in the creative space that I had no idea that business school had so many connections, even within things like creative and the arts. So definitely a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Um, I, for me, um, I mean, the first, pub I got my publisher through somebody from the, so someone in the class of 92 gave a talk at a women in business conference, I think when I was in business school, um, and talked about her book. And I was like, she wrote a book. And so I called her, I'm like through the alumni thing. And I, I kind of, had, I mean, I knew her a little bit. And I said, hey, I know you wrote a business book. I want to write a business book. Can you walk me through the process? And I actually did that with, with people from the GSB and also just anybody else that I could kind of get in touch with um, and just tried to learn as much as I could. And then she introduced me to other people. And she ultimately introduced me to my publisher, um, to my acquisitions editor at McGraw-Hill. Um, so uh, that was a direct, a direct hit. And then, like I said, um, lots of classmates um, read the book. And I also have featured, like, there's five or six classmates that are quoted in the book um, because I think because it is a business book, um, it lends itself really well to, uh, to getting support from, from, from classmates and, and fellow alums. Uh, you spoke about the value of, of having an agent. Uh, could you share a bit about how you went about finding the right agent, any resources that were particularly helpful and also the kind of decision-making criteria that you used? Thank you. Is it a B2B, is it a business book or a fiction or a nonfiction or fiction? I'll apply it to both considering I'm not writing anything as yet. Okay, well, I, I probably did the most traditional agent path. So I'll take that first and then Robbie can probably add different color to it. But um, as I mentioned before with, with traditional publishers, um, and fiction work, you, you have to have an agent. And so it's the first step is getting an agent and then that agent is responsible for getting you a publisher. And there's a, a pretty um, established process for getting an agent. You do something called writing a query letter and it's a very standard format of three paragraphs. There's lots of information online if you, you know, wanna find exactly what's supposed to go into each paragraph and then you there are a couple online marketplaces that list agents their clients you know whether they're open to new clients what type of um genres they represent and then their specific requirements for querying so some some will say i want a query letter and you know attach the first five pages of your manuscript or i just want the query letter or you know they, they all have different rules and i would say it's sort of old fashioned, but you just have to follow those rules. Like people sometimes think because it's, you know, a creative realm that you, you know, you should, you need to like show how different you are and like change the font and all that. No, they, they have a very staid way of operating and there's, there's rationale behind it. I mean, they know by the time they get to page five of a manuscript that's in Times New Roman 12 point with one inch margins, they're a certain, they should feel a certain thing, you know, if they're getting pulled into the book or not. So I would say just look up those rules and, and, you know, find the age, the list of agents that you think is relevant for you, either through one of those marketplaces or the way I did it actually was back when we could go to bookstores freely. I would go to the, go to the bookstore and find the books that I thought were there's sort of what I was aspiring to be. Like I would want my book to be on the shelf next to those books. And I flipped to the end to the acknowledgements and 
found out who those authors agents were. And then I would write to them and say, you know, my book, so-and-so secret daughter, 80,000 words would sit very comfortably on the shelf next to your author so-and-so's book. Um, because what they want to see is that you've targeted them for good reason and you followed their rules. And so it's in some ways, again, it's like, it's kind of simple. You don't have to innovate that much. You just have to sort of, you know, plug into the established system. Um, and then if you're lucky enough to get an offer of representation or more than one, um, because I had a business background, I asked those agents um, for references, which I didn't realize how uh, unusual and, un, you know, that people don't do that. You don't ask for references, but, you know, I, I was used to hiring people and I, you know, I asked for references. So um, then I called each of them, you know, a few people for each agent. And that really helped solidify who I thought was going to be the best fit for me. Yeah. So mine was a business book. I, I'll, I'll just pipe in because it's a different process. Um, you don't have to write the book uh, for a nonfiction uh, title. You just have to write your proposal. And um, as Shilpi said with, with her process, with the, with the query letter, it's a very rigid um, standard format. Um, and there's lots of examples online. And there are entire books that just have examples of different um, of of different um, book proposals. So you can actually read real book proposals for books that you might be familiar with um, to, get, to get inspiration and ideas. And usually what they're looking for is an executive summary um, and then a lot of proof that you're gonna market the book and that you're, you have a platform um, that people are gonna wanna hear what you have to say and then a sample chapter. Um, and, then, and then the process is very similar. Um, I made a list of agents that I thought would be interested in my book. Very similar. I went to the bookstore, looked in the back of the book, looked for who the agents were of the books that were like my book. Um, and actually, there's one section of a business book proposal that you're supposed to have, which is um, competitive titles or analogous titles. So, um, you know, I looked at those and I said, well, who published those? If none of them were directly competitive. I said, if you're interested in this space, my book would, be, would probably be interesting to you. Um, and then I reached out to them. I tried to find like the way I do it is I pick the, you know, figure out who the agent was and why I wanted that agent. And then I tried to go one more step and say, do I know anybody who already works with them who can make that introduction? Um, but that was my process. And, um, you know, I ended up going with an agent that was based in San Francisco because I felt like he really understood my content in a way that the other agents that were mostly in New York they just, I just didn't feel like they understood what was happening um, in my space. Um, and so I ended up going with, with the one I did because I felt like he, um, he, had, he had come out of the tech world and he got what I was talking about. A question from somebody who hasn't been able to raise their hand is, um, what's one thing you would do differently or you wish you knew at the beginning of the process from any of you? I actually have a little bit of a different take on that because I, I went into writing fiction pretty blind and I didn't know what I didn't know. And in some ways, I think that really helped me. Um, as I mentioned before, like my business background helped me look at contracts and agents and business relationships and dec decisions a little bit more critically um, and analytically than I think a lot of writers do. Um, and I also you know, I just, I didn't know which rules not to break. So for example, when I wrote, was writing my first novel in 2007, 2006 is when I started writing it, I had multiple narrators. And at the time that was something that wasn't done and was frowned upon, but I didn't know that. Um, I also wrote in present tense because it worked best for my story again, mostly out of ignorance, a lot of people don't like that. Um, and so had I listened to people who said like, here are the big list of things that you're never supposed to do when you're trying to get published for the first time, I probably would have just been stifled. You know, if I, if I, knew, if I knew that the odds of getting, getting published were as thin as they were, I probably would have just given up in the beginning or I certainly wouldn't have written the story I wrote. Um, and so I think there's some magic to not knowing, at least on the creative front, um, to not overthinking it too much. Um, now it's helpful to have a business background because I can switch, you know, when my book is finished, it's a product that needs to be marketed. And then there's a whole other way that I need to think about it. And I can make that, 
um, transition pretty easily, whereas I think a lot of people who are, you know, who'd consider themselves deeply creative and artistic might not be able to say, okay, well, now it's a widget that needs to get into Barnes and Noble. So, um, and Costco, preferably. So, so I think, um, I don't know, I think a little bit of ignorance, at least in my case, was helpful to, to not stifling the, the creative process. I have to agree on the ignorance point. I, I would answer this question saying, I wish I knew how much it was going to cost, but I have a feeling that if I knew, I wouldn't have done it um, because I, I started this right out of undergrad and in total, I probably spent 25 grand and as a 22 year old who did not have any money and has student loans coming out of undergrad, I would have like told myself I can't do this, but because I did it little by little over time, book by book, illustrator by illustrator, I now look back and tally how much it cost me. And it's a, it's a big number for someone of that age, but I'm kind of glad I didn't know. But if you're self-publishing, you might want to think about all of those costs because you are going to be doing everything yourself. Great. Uh, for Shopee, again, following up on the uh, agenting thing, you mentioned at the beginning of your bit about going to a conference and meeting some agents there. And um, I wondered if uh, you could speak to the efficacy of that. I've written a thriller and, you know, there's a thriller fest every year that I signed up for, but of course it got pandemic. So uh, I'm just wondering your view of um, sort of the efficacy of, of meeting someone that way versus, you know, the query letter uh, email kind of thing, and which you think works best or would work best or are yes. viable. Uh, so I was really fortunate because the creative writing program that I, I lucked into at SMU had at the time something called the SMU Writers Conference in New York, and they would pre-select 10 people who had to have full manuscripts that had been vetted and then they would take us to New York and sit us down with six meetings with agents and editors to give us feedback. Um, and so it was a really intimate, um, unique opportunity to meet with people. It wasn't like a, you know, a big convention where you're like trying to track people down and wearing your badge and all that kind of stuff. It was very intimate. Um, they unfortunately no longer do it. They've closed that program at SMU. But I do know people who go to um, other, you know, more genre um, limited writers conferences like you've mentioned. And I think the key is to be good in person, like to be able to verbalize your, your elevator pitch very quickly in, you know, three sentences. So when you're at, you know, the cocktail party and you see the agent or two or three agents, you can sort of give them that pitch. And I think if you can do that effectively, like if the group is small and targeted enough, if it's not 5,000 people at the Javits Center, which who knows if that's ever going to happen again now, but you know, if it's relatively small and targeted and you have a good pitch, you present well in person, then I think it's a great way to sort of backdoor into agents who, you know, they're also sort of subliminally testing for like, how marketable is this person? You know, how well are they going to do with PR? Are they going to stand up and do well at book events? So they may not say they're looking for that, but if you can present that way, then you're sort of checking a lot of boxes for them and they'll be interested in, um, you know, reading what comes through, you know, you'll go to the top of the slush pile because they'll remember you from that conference. Great, good, thank you. Um, I was wondering if one possible pathway is to start writing shorter works, um, short stories, uh, blogs about various aspects of science. I'm thinking of writing them, you know, them from science popularization as a way of kind of breaking in, both getting your, um, finding your voice and also becoming known. And, and, you know, later on that could help with marketing, getting agents, et cetera, editors, et cetera. Um, whatever comments you might have about that approach. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I mean, it, it probably depends on, on what you're what you're doing. But I know that for if, if you're writing a science book, if you're writing an, an, a nonfiction book in particular, I mean, a big part of the book proposal is how good is your platform? Um, do people like what you write? Um, are they interested in your point of view? Do you have the ability to reach them because of your, you know, your Instagram following or your Twitter following or your LinkedIn following or wherever you are? People read your Medium articles. 
Um, I think it's really important from a, from a marketing um, perspective, but also um, just from an experiential perspective that you, you start to build up a body of work. And I, I know several people whose books are really um, a massaged collection of articles um, where, you know, it, you know, back to the point of like, what's your best way of writing? If you said, you know, look, every Tuesday, I'm going to publish an article and it's going to be something that I find fascinating. And at the end of the year, I'm going to look at my 52 articles and I'm going to think about how to put them into a structure, or I'm going to write an outline for a book and every week I'm going to publish a chapter. Um, you know, those are, those are great tactics to just get your, get your writing done as well as to build your personal brand. I, I do a ton of personal brand building, by the way, like I'm publishing an article every week and a podcast every week and, um, you know, post on Instagram. So, you know, having that, that pulpit or that, that platform, I think is, is increasingly important for authors. Uh, my question is for Robbie, and I wonder if you went about trying to uncover stories for the book or go deeper into the stories and how you went about doing that. Yeah, definitely. So um, I, I, in order to get the book proposal accepted, I had to write an outline um, of the book and sort of say, this is what I'm going to cover. And then I also had to write um, a list of some of the stories that I thought I was going to share. So I said something like, and I'll be sharing stories such as, or potentially to include, you know, Netflix, Amazon, Spotify, Salesforce, whatever, whatever. Um, and then I, um, so in some cases, so I had a really, again, I had this very long list of, of stories that I thought I might write and people that I thought might have interesting bits to, to contribute to the book. And so, especially in the early phases of the book, I just interviewed a lot of people. And in some cases, you know, I'd be like, oh, this interview, there's not that much there, or they're not telling me much because of confidentiality. This isn't interesting. And I might just mention them in the acknowledgments, like this was one of the people that I interviewed. Um, and then in some cases, I would write, actually, as soon as I finished my interview, my process was I would write a snippet. I called it a snippet, and I had a snippet folder, and it would just be the story. So, like, it would say, you know... I talked to Jason at Google and he said these, you know, he, this is his background and this is what he thinks and this is what was important. And it's almost something that could be cut and pasted right into a chapter with a little massaging at the, at the beginning and end. Um, or, you know, I could always go back and use it as notes. So, so that was my, was my process. And, you know, to the question of what would you do differently? Um, I would have asked more people earlier on for interviews um, and not been afraid to ask strangers because, you know, some people I knew really well said no or wouldn't tell me anything useful. And um, some complete strangers that run big companies were willing to talk to me and share really powerful stories and advice. So um, certainly use the GSB network to reach out and um, don't even be shy about just reaching out. Like I reached out through LinkedIn to all kinds of people, um, some of whom responded. So yeah, that's how I did it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for putting this together. I really enjoyed uh, the discussion so far. Uh, I was curious about, uh, I'm writing a business book and I'm curious about the pros and cons of having a co-author work with you. Um, and uh, also kind of a, on a related note, I checked in the Stanford University Press. I figured maybe I have an in there, uh, but uh, it's, it feels like you you sort of have to co-author with a professor in order to get published there. And I'm wondering if anybody has any experience on that. Yeah. So, so before we answer that, I know that um, at least one person, I don't know if they're still here, but I remembered seeing in the chat that somebody's doing that. So if they could um, maybe write their comments in the chat while we're, while we're responding. Um, I wrote my book alone and I thought about using a, a co-publish, a co-author, um, but I'd heard honestly, too many stories of friendships breaking up over co-writing. Um, and I just decided I wanted to control my narrative. Um, but I don't know, um, Diane or, or Shilpi, do you have thoughts? Uh, I have heard from professor friends who write with university presses that it's a different animal. Um, 
and often they can't get published by their own university press. So they, there's you know, some weird politics there. So they'll go to another university's press. So I think it's its own world and you probably have to learn about it. I, I would never be able to co-write with anyone. I'm too much of a solo flyer. <laughs> Great, so I'm going to start moving to questions from uh, Q&A, but feel free to raise your hand at one point if another question pops up. Uh, we have a lot of questions asking about money. So, uh, Doyen and Robbie, you've, talked, you've touched a little bit about uh, how expensive it really was to get started. So I know that it's going to vary across your experiences, but um, can you just dive a little more deeper into the money side of things? How much does it really cost to pay an agent um, to market your book? How much can you really expect to get back um, any, anything that you can add to that conversation? Again, this is one end of the spectrum. This is um, traditional publishing with a big publisher. Um, on the agent side, it's very standard. It's 15% of royalties, unless it's foreign um, royalties or film, in which case it's 20% because there are two agents. There's always a film agent and your literary agent or a like a German agent and the American agent. So then it's 10 and 10. So 15 to 20% of royalties to an agent. Um, and on the revenue side, it's really, um, it depends on the format your book is selling in. So, you know, roughly speaking, a hardcover sale will get like three to four dollars to the to the author. Paperback will get one to two. And ebook is somewhere between because Amazon and the publishers are constantly fighting. So if you think about on average, you're making say two to three dollars a book domestically and probably a little bit less internationally, you know, it depends on the number of books you sell. Um, that is a traditional publishing contract where the author gets a percentage of royalties and an advance is what you're paid up front and it's always against royalties. So if you sell a lot of books, in the end, everything comes out the same. Um, if you don't sell a lot of books, then you ideally, you know, people want a higher advance because it's the publishers taking more of the risk than the author. But in the end, it should always be the same unless you're not selling a lot of books. <laughs> and then it becomes harder to sell your next book if you haven't earned out. I don't know if that's, is that, did I use too much lingo? Did that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, that was good. I thought that was really good. Um, you know, so, so I'll add, so I have an agent too, um, same, same structure, um, you know, three bucks a book. Um, my books are all hardcover. Uh, as I said, you know, I'm not trying to make any money for my books. I see my book as a marketing expense. So I actually went into the process expecting to, like with a budget for my book, not expecting to make any money um, from the book. I have, I have ended up making, making some money um, from the book, but I didn't expect it. Um, and I, I guess, you know, to talk about the money, I spent a lot of money up front on the book. So I hired um, a developmental editor, I hired a um, copy editor and I hired, you know, sort of a line editor to clean it up at the end to make sure that it was ready for the publisher and formatted properly. And, you know, I didn't have any typos and things like that. Um, so I spent money on, on all of those things. I also, for the marketing of the book, um, you know, McGraw-Hill um, was somewhat, there, you know, they were somewhat supportive. They did dedicate some resources to helping me in the beginning. They also were willing to give away books on my behalf. So I made a big list of books, you know, as many as I could think of early on because that, that door closes after some point. But, you know, they gave away a lot of books. They give me some books. I mean, this is something I didn't really know. They give me, I think, I don't know, a few hundred books. But after that, I have to buy them. So when an author gives you a book, just remember that it, that it might be coming right out of their pocket, that they might have, you know, I pay whatever, $12.95 so that I can give someone a book um, once I've blown through the books that they gave me for free. Um, and then I paid for uh, a, a PR person um, on the print side and a PR person, you know, on the traditional media side. And then I paid for a digital PR person who was really focused on mostly on podcasts, which has been a really powerful way to, to build awareness of the book. Um, and I paid for somebody to create you know, an awesome website and, um, you know, some, some digital, some video, um, you know, kind of book summary and book teasers. So um, I think I've probably spent, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars, maybe $50,000 
all in on things relating to the book? Thanks, Robbie. And I actually really hate to break in because we could, I think, do this for a lot longer, but we want to move on. And I really just want to take these last few moments here to thank you for being with us today and to thank all of our panelists, Robbie and Shilpi and Doyen for being here. I mean, just such practical advice, inspiring advice, and you know, some a really good path forward, I hope, for all of you with these last breakouts. And uh, we hope we'll see you soon. Thanks for being with us today.